بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه Welcome back to our second class in reading the abridgment of Imam al-Bayhaqi's Shu'ab al-Iman, the branches of faith. So today, inshallah, we begin with branch number seven. قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الضارين آمين The seventh branch or the seventh from the branches of faith is belief in the resurrection after death. This is related to where we left off in the last class, and I talked about the importance that belief, our belief in the hereafter, necessitates belief in the hisab, necessitates belief that we will be asked, <clears throat> excuse me, we will be asked about our actions. And that is completely antithetical to the belief of this karmic cycle in which there is reincarnation. And as I mentioned, in the dominant culture, uh, there are aspects of that Eastern paradigm that have become popular uh, through things like yoga or, or meditation. Um, of course, these are not all black and white issues, but I meant that because these things have seeped into the modern uh, culture, you will find people by default, they will make reference to things like karma and, oh, that's an act of karma or something like that. And I just want to highlight that it's a very, you know, that's why this is one of the branches of our faith. This is important to believe in this. So he says, based on the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, So the disbelievers claim that they will be raised from the dead. Sorry, the disbelievers claim that they will not be raised from the dead. Say, Prophet Sallallahu yes, indeed, I swear by Allah, you will be raised. So even this is something old, that there are people that disbelieve. That many people feel that uh, death is the end of life. That's it. Somebody dies and that's it. But for us, it's not the case. Death is simply the movement from one part of life to another part of life. And that's why we honor the deceased by washing the body, by shrouding the body, by praying on the body, the Janaza prayer, and by burying the body, all of these in specific ways. Well, that shows us that there is life still after after death. Also due to the speech of Allah, Say it is Allah who gives you life, then causes you to die, and then he gathers you all to the day of resurrection, of which there is no doubt. Additionally, due to the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu in the authentic collection regarding the hadith about faith, this is a reference to the hadith of Gabriel, which is a hadith that will come up you know, frequently in this type of discussion. Faith is that you believe in God or Allah, his angels, his books, his, mes his messengers in resurrection after death and in fate, all of it. Okay, so the seventh branch, therefore, is the belief in the resurrection after death. Not only will we die, but we will be resurrected after die. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man mata faqamat uh, Whoever dies, then their qiyamah has begun. So even though there is a time, now of course that's an important thing, by the way, to remember, is that time is relative in, in the sense that when we die, the way we experience time after death is different than the time that we experience now. The time that we experience now based on the movement of the sun, the, the movement of the earth, sorry, the movement of the earth around the sun, et cetera, we experience the cycle of day and night. We, we experience the cycle of hours and minutes and seconds. <clears throat> uh, and it's, you know, all people on earth experience it the same way. But when you go to another planet, for example, even now, if you were going to another planet, time is different. Just like gravity and the, the, the gravitational force and mass is different. So if you understand that, then you can also understand how that when you die and you are resurrected, you will experience time differently. Allah tells us in the Quran, <inaudible> they see it as something far away, but we see it as something close. That, you know, one year with Allah Ta'ala is several thousand years in our counting. When we die, the angels will ask us, <inaudible> you know, how long was your whole life? And we will say, it was a day or actually it was just part of a day. So this whole life that we experience now, when we die and are resurrected, we will experience it, we will look back and look at it as a matter of minutes because the experience of time will be different. So that's something I might have uh, uh, failed to mention yesterday when we talked about 
uh, about this issue. So we will be resurrected after death. That is a quintessential part of our faith. Number eight, the eighth from the branches of faith is belief in the gathering of the people after they have been resurrected from their graves to the place of standing, al-hashr. Based on the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَلَا يَذُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Do these people not realize that they will be raised up on a mighty day, <clears throat> a day in which, and when everyone will stand before the Lord of the worlds? Also due to the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, narrated in the collection of Sahih Muslim, the hadith is, يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ حَتَّى يَغِيبَ أَحَدُهُمْ فِي رَشْحِهِ إِلَىٰ أَنصَافِ أُذُنَيْهِ The people will stand before the Lord of the worlds until one of them will be submerged in perspiration till halfway up his, upon his ears. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. So, the standing, the fact that we will be resurrected and stand before Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, that's an intense experience. And the hadith about the perspiration is because it will be due to the stress and the anxiety and the heat of the sun that we will experience. There will be no shade except the shade that is provided by the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this reminds us of another series of ahadith in which there are, uh, as the Prophet Sassam indicated to us, those special people and categories of the people that will be shaded in the shade of the throne on the day in which there is no shade. So th that those hadith are referring to this issue. Uh, and even though the hadith, that hadith, by the way, what's interesting is that it's narrated with different categories. And some of the ulama, again, as I mentioned yesterday, took it upon themselves to gather all of the people. There, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of categories of people that will be shaded in that shade. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to make us amongst them. But things like uh, somebody who uh, whose eyes cried by, through, by mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person uh, who loved another person only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person whose heart was attached to the masajid, to the mosques, meaning their heart was attached to prayer, that they were always praying, so on and so on, many, many categories. So despite the hadith that ends this, Number eight, this little section we're on. Yes, it's a time in which there will be great stress and anxiety for those who are not in the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for you to understand the enormity of these matters, there's another hadith that describes for us the, the size, the physical size of the throne. The throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the largest created entity in creation. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said that, as we know, there are seven heavens. And he said, the first level of heaven compared to this world. Now, this world means everything that we see in the observable universe, which is massive. He said, the comparison of the first level of heaven, uh, the, sorry, this world in comparison to the first level of heaven is as if you have taken a ring and you threw it in the desert. So this ring would represent the entire universe that we see. And if you threw this ring in a desert, well, I mean, the ring is inconsequential compared to the desert. That desert is the first level of heaven. And the first level of heaven in comparison to the second level of heaven is is a ring thrown into a desert. All the way to the seventh level of heaven in comparison to the size of the throne is like a ring thrown into a desert. So those are magnitudes of sizes that we cannot comprehend. You can maybe comprehend all of this world and close your eyes. It's like bound in something small and then there's something that's larger. But then that larger thing is now confined to something small and it's connected to something that's even larger. Well, the, the higher up you go, the more insignificant this world and we and our possessions become. So therefore, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this ginormous thing that, can, that covers all of the heavens. So it's very easy that the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can accommodate all of humanity from the beginning of humanity till the end of humanity. 
So again, sizes that, you know, impossible for us to draw or to imagine, but yeah, we can we can try at least rationally to comprehend the enormity of it. So inshallah, we will be amongst those people uh, that will be shaded, but there will be people, unfortunately, that are not shaded and it will be a stressful uh, time. So we will be, you know, this is part of part of our faith. Number nine, the ninth from the branches of faith is believe that the residency and abode of the believers is the garden. May Allah Ta'ala make this amongst them, inshallah. And the residency and abode of the disbelievers is the fire. So after that standing, there is a judgment. And after that judgment, there is you're in one of the two places. Uh, of course, there are people, inshallah, that will enter paradise without being taken to account, which is what we always ask, you know, that we ask Allah to enter us into paradise hisab, without being taken to account. Because if you're taken to account, you're not going to win that equation. Yeah, you're always going to come up short, except by Allah's mercy. So when we, when we make that dua, we're saying... Look, we, we, don't, we know that when our actions are not enough. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge that all we have is Allah's mercy. So, yeah, Allah, please enter us into your paradise without being taken to account. So in this one, he's reminding us that there is a terminal, you know, a terminus. There's an end to this, to this journey after death, uh, either to paradise or to the hellfire. Based on the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, بَلَمَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ وَلَذِينَ آمَنُوا عَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Truly those who do evil and are surrounded by the sins, by their sins will be the inhabitants of the fire, there to remain, while those who believe and do good deeds will be the inhabitants of the garden, there to remain. Also due to the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma in the two authentic collections, Bukhari and Muslim, إِنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ إِذَا مَاتَ عُرِدَ عَلَيْهِ مَقْعَدُهُ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي إِنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ فَمِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ يُقَالُ هَذَا مَقْعَدُكَ هَذَا مَقْعَدُكَ حَتَّى يَبْعَثَكَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِلَيْهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Perspirate. Mm. Sorry, there's a, I think that footnote in my PDF is from the previous page, so sorry. Indeed, when any one of you dies, he is shown his seat in the hereafter, in the morning and evening. If he is amongst the people of the garden, he is shown his seat from amongst the people of the garden. And if he is one from amongst the denizens of hell, he is shown his seat from amongst the denizens of hell. And it is said to him, this is your seat until Allah raises you towards him on the day of resurrection. And that's what I mentioned earlier, that whoever dies, their hisab has begun because your grave will be a portion of this final place. So inshallah, for the believers, for us, our grave will be a garden from the gardens of paradise. So when you die, that grave then becomes, it's like a lounge area, waiting area for the final final place, but it will be a portion of that final place. And for the people, God forbid, who are from the people of the hellfire, their their grave will be like a portion or, or that waiting area, a portion of the final place where they will, will go in their hellfire. Um, you find frequently uh, the wording in the Quran and in the Hadith that you will dwell therein forever. Khalidina fiha. You know, al khulud is to be there forever. Khalidina fiha abada, to be, you know, to emphasize to be there forever. And this is a debate amongst the theologians. Is hell, the, the, the people that are in the hellfire, are they in the hellfire eternally, forever? Or is there an end? Now, of course, the majority of the ulama and the majority of the ulama <coughs> within Sunni Islam will say, yes, I mean, it's clear from the text of the Quran as it is. But there are some, a, a minority of people that have a nuanced understanding that hellfire uh, will itself cease. That even the people that will be punished in the hellfire, they, they will be um, not necessarily taken out, but that punishment, it will almost turn into like an imprisonment. Like people that are in prison for life they live a life. They they eat, they sleep, they have a community, they exercise, they have a library, they have recreation. I mean, it's in prison 
And those people that are in prison for so long, in, in many respects, they can't leave prison because if they leave, they won't know how to survive. So some of the ulama, uh, and this actually goes back to a position held by Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu and a position popularized by Ibn Arabi, the, the famous Sufi mystic radiallahu anhu, Sheikh al-Akbar, that there is an end to the hellfire. And I just flag that because it's it's appropriate to mention. Of course, that's not the majority position. So I want to be clear about that. And it's not one of those things where we have to get super excited about, uh, you know, by subscribing to the majority position, you're safe. But it's, it bears mentioning that there is another position. Okay. Uh, the 10th. The tenth from the branches of faith is to believe in the necessity of having love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Based on the speech of Allah ta'ala, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ Even so, there are some who choose to worship others beside Allah as rivals to Him, loving them with the love due to Allah, but the believers have better or greater love for Allah. Also to, due to the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, narrated in Bukhari and Muslims, ثَلَاثَةٌ مَنْ كُنَّ فِيهِ وَجَدِ بِهِنَّ حَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ أَنْ يَكُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا سِوَاهُمَا وَأَنْ يُحِبَّ الْمَرْأَ لَا يُحِبُّهُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ وَأَنْ يَكْرَهَ أَنْ يَعُودَ فِي الْكُفْرِ بَعْدَ أَنْ أَنْقَضَهُ اللَّهُ مِنْهُ كَمَا يَكْرَهُ أَنْ تُوْقَدَ لَهُ نَارٌ فَيَقْذِفُ فِيهَا When three characteristics exist in an individual, he will acquire the sweetness of faith. The first is that Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to him than anything else. The second is that he loves a person only for the sake of Allah. And the third is that he dislikes to return to disbelief after Allah has resurrected him from it, just like he dislikes that a fire is kindled for him and he is thrown therein. Imam al bayhaqi informed us of it, saying that he heard from Abu Abdul Rahman al Sulami, saying that he heard from Abu Nadar al Tusi, saying that he heard from Jafar al Khuldi, saying that he heard from Imam al Junaid, who said, A man asked Sari al Sakati, so also a Sir al Sakati, How are you? So he replied, Malam Yabit wal Hubbu. والحب حشو فؤاده لم يدري كيف تفتت الأكباد. Whoever does not live with loving, with love filling his heart, will never know how chests are burst open. Abu Abd al-Rahman al-Sunami has informed us that he heard Abu Nas Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ismail saying that he heard Abu al-Qasim al-Razi, the preacher, say that he heard. Abu Dujana saying, when Rabia was overwhelmed with love, he would say, Tasil ilaha wa anta tudhiru hubbahu, hadha muhalu fil fil fi'ali badi'u, law kana hubbuka sadiqan la ata'atuhu inna al muhibba liman yuhibbu muti'u. You disobey God whilst displeasing your love for him. This is impossible and a strange occurrence. If your love was true and sincere, you would obey him for the lover to whom he loves is obedient. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in this one. So let's go back to the beginning. This is the uh, necessity of having love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people that believe they are the ones that Allah love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most. And it's interesting, isn't it, that our... Uh, faith is based on love. In other words, it's not based on fear. It's not based on wanting something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not based on seeking something from him, or even nor is it even based on seeking to avoid the hellfire, but rather our faith, one of the branches of our faith itself is to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the poem that he ends with at the end, it's, it's commonly attributed to Imam al-Shafi'i uh, as well, is that when you love somebody, you are obedient to that person. You obey that love. Uh, don't you see that when you love a person, when you fall in love with somebody, uh, which is one of the greatest experiences, you, you can't get that person out of your mind. And you, you, you go to the greatest extents 
to please that person. That's what the obedience is uh, for a person who loves somebody and they fall in love with somebody. They will stay up all night. Uh, they will go out of their comfort zone. They will buy them gifts. They will uh, change their own behavior and character to, to please that person. If you love somebody and you know that they love um, roses, you're going to, you know, all buy roses all the time. If you love somebody and they, they are allergic to um, some kind of, they have an allergy to some kind of nut, nut allergy, you know, you're going to give up eating that kind of nut and make sure that it's never around. That's what the obedience is. You end up obeying that love. You end up submitting to that love. And I give this as an example because certainly we've experienced, I hope, inshallah, love on a human level. And there are different types of love, of course. There's love of your parents, which is different than love of your siblings, which is different love of friends, which is different than romantic love for a person of the opposite sex in which you end up seeking marriage. And the intimacy, the sexual intimacy that ensues with that love is yet another dimension of that love. But in all of those different types of love, you can see how there is this obedience to the love. In other words, you give in to that love and that love transforms you. So, and as we say, and to Allah belongs the greater example. So therefore, if we have love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to change our character, change our way of living to be in concordance with that love. So this is a very powerful verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Ladina Amanu Ashaddu Hubba Lillah, you know, those who believe they are the ones that have serious and, and have the, the, the most form of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it's not lip service. It's not um it's not just something that you say because it's the right thing to say, but rather it's something that you are, you are that love, and therefore you follow it. Now, the hadith of Anas, radiallahu anhu, the three characteristics, again, very powerful. He's, he talks about halawatul iman, the sweetness of faith. Like that sweetness that you experience when you fall in love with somebody. It's, there's a sweetness to it that's almost indescribable, that, that cannot be, you know, oftentimes when somebody falls in love with somebody, we say, you know, you're glowing. There is a glow, there's something that physically, there's a physical change in your physiology, uh, in your posture, in your speech, in how you look. Uh, you smile more, you're happy more, uh, your eyes light up. There's something physical that happens. Right? We say this in, in, in normal uh, language, and you're glowing. So now imagine how, how this relates to, to the love that comes from faith in God, that, that, that's even, even greater than that. So there's a sweetness to having that faith. It's like you were lost and you had a hole inside you because you didn't have that faith. And now that you believe that hole has been filled, which is why when believers talk about non-believers, they often talk about the emptiness in disbelief, the darkness in disbelief, uh, the struggle, the depression, the anxiety that people of no faith have. Because when you have faith, faith, you know, as as is being described in this book, I mean, real faith that's that's rooted in these things, then uh, you have a different perspective, even on the calamitous parts of life, the difficult parts of life, the tests of life. It's just you have a different, you know, that it's all in Allah Ta'ala's hands. So there's a sweetness to having that void filled. And then the second thing he says, by the way, he also mentions uh, uh, love of the Prophet I'm just looking forward to see if it's mentioned as a separate thing maybe it is I don't want to get too far ahead now I lost my page uh, okay sorry so he says in the hadith of Anas um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim uh, sweetness of faith the first is that Allah and his messenger are more beloved to him than anything else so one of the branches of faith is also love of the Prophet, alayhi salatu Not just love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Actually, the Prophet he said, as is narrated in Bukhari, none of you truly believe. None of you truly believe until I am more beloved to you than your own wealth, your own family and children, uh, and all people, even more than you love yourself. That the love of the Prophet supersedes that. And Alhamdulillah, one of the miracles of Islam is that we we know everything about the Prophet There's nothing about him that we don't know. We know how he looked, how he smelled, how he dressed, how he ate, how he sat, how he slept, how he spoke. uh, Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There's no aspect of him that is hidden from us. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And one of the miracles, I mean, that's a miracle because... Uh, I always tell my students, we do not know how Shakespeare spoke, how he sounded. When people read Shakespeare, they have a tendency to read in a British accent. But the modern British accent is not the accent, is not the English of Shakespeare. We do not know how it sounded. If you take some of these ancient uh, pieces of literature, uh, the, the poems uh, the, the, um, uh, the poems of um, Homer, the Iliad, and the, and the Odyssey, we do not know how those sounded in the ancient Greek. We do not know how the poem of Gilgamesh sounds in its original language. We, we can try, we can approximate, but we don't know how it sounded. There is a distance between us and them. So even, uh, I mean, maybe Homer and, and Gilgamesh, these are ancient, but Shakespeare is relatively recent, a few hundred years ago. I mean, I think 1500s. I mean, relatively recent in the span of human history. Whereas the Prophet lived over 1400 years ago, yet there is no ambiguity. There's nothing hidden from him to us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's a miracle. That's a, that's a miracle um, right up there with the miracle that the Quran is preserved. So uh, speaking of Shakespeare, by the way, I think it was last year or, or it was a part, it was during COVID, maybe it was last year or the year before, where the Globe Theater in London, um, because they weren't able to have performances, that this is a... Uh, a theater dedicated to performing the plays uh, of Shakespeare. And it's built to look like uh, the model of the actual Globe Theater that Shakespeare would have performed his his original plays at. And they were, because they were not able to open to the public because of the, the quarantine, uh, the staff went about cleaning, just, you know, cleaning around. And they found in the attic new plays, a couple, I think it was one or two plays that have never been published before uh, that are attributed to Shakespeare. We don't have that with the Quran. No one's found a new surah or a new juz. No one's found a new set of hadith. So the preservation of our primary sources, the Quran and the hadith, as well as the person of the Prophet is a miracle. And this is what facilitates our love of him because Allah Ta'ala has not hidden anything of him from us. So the more that we know him, the more that we fall in love with him, the more that we are going to be obedient to that love and follow his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the, the hadith continues. The second is that you love somebody for the sake of Allah. You know, in, in human relationships, the older you get, oftentimes you find that you're always looking for something from someone. There's always an angle, there's always a hustle, there's always um, uh, a need and when you have a relationship that is purely based on the love of God it, it really is something that's refreshing and actually unfortunately something very rare I mean if you sit down after this class and you were to audit all of your relationships how many people are you associ- closely associated with friends you know best friends etc only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no, what we say in Arabic, maslaha. There's no uh, needs or there's no interests or there's no dunya and money exchanged between you. Your friends purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a sign of faith because that's something that's very beautiful. And of course, the third is that you disliked to be go back to disbelief after belief. So when you find faith, you know, even if you were born Muslim, by the way, this is not. Um, something for somebody who was not a Muslim. But even if you're born Muslim, sometimes you can be born Muslim and be Muslim in name only, not really in practice. But at some point you find that faith and you're like, oh my God, you know, there's this whole part of me that was missing and I can't believe, you know, and then you you hate to go back to how you were before. 
You would hate to go back to those habits and to those to those things. So that's a beautiful hadith. And then <clears throat> this this um, these two poems. I just wanted to mention a little, a little thing about it, which, as I as I said yesterday in our introductory remarks, that Imam al Bayhaqi was a, a hadith master, uh, and he lived as we said, at the end of the period of the Salaf. So it is common uh, in his original book and in this abridgment, it is common that you will find these full chains of transmission. Imam al-Sulami, rahimahullah radiallahu anhu, was a, uh, a, a, a Salaf from, from the Salaf al-Salah, and he was also a, a well-known Sufi. And Imam al-Sulami's works, uh, he is one of the uh, people, his added value to the intellectual history of Islam is he provided the early chains of transmissions for these Sufi sayings. And uh, this idea that tasawwuf is part of Islam as it is because it's mentioned in the hadith of Gabriel al-Ihsan, Imam al-Sulami demonstrates that for us, that all of these statements and all of the, in this case, these lines of poetry, they go back to the same chains of transmission from the same type of people that are narrating the hadith, from the same people that are narrating the Qur'an. And as sir al-Saqati, well, Imam al-Junaid is Imam al-Junaid. Imam al-Junaid, radiallahu anhu, is considered the, the founder uh, of the way of tasawwuf, the one who formalized tasawwuf. Uh, just like um, uh, uh, Imam al-Shafi is, is considered the one who formulated and, and wrote down the science of usul al-fiqh. That doesn't mean that the Hanafis and the Malikis before Imam al-Shafi didn't have usul al-fiqh. They had usul al-fiqh. But Imam al-Shafi was the first to sit down and write it and organize it and call it by its name and therefore got that, you know, that thing going. Imam al-Junaid is considered the same thing for tasawwuf. And then and the Sir al-Saqati, Radiallahu anhu is one of the early uh, Sufis who, in most chains uh, of transmission for different Sufi orders, they'll go through uh, as Sir Saqati, of course, and Imam Junaid as well. Um, as I said, the, the poem at the very end uh, uh, that he quotes by Ar Rabia, it's, it's, it's also commonly quoted, if I'm not mistaken, it is in the Diwan of Imam al Shafi. And if I'm not mistaken, Imam al-Shafi was prior. So I, I, I believe it is more correctly attributed to Imam al-Shafi, although I could be wrong because I'm not an expert in that. Um, okay, there's nothing else I want to say about this. Uh, number 11, the 11th branch, 11th from the branches of faith is belief in the necessity of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's read this. Based on the speech of Allah, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not fear them, but fear me, if you are true believers. Also the verse, فَلَا تَخْشَوُ النَّاسَ وَخْشَوُنْ Do not fear people, but fear me. Also the verse, وَإِيَّايَ فَرْهَبُونْ I am the one you should fear. Also the verse, وَهُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَتِهِ مُشْفِقُونَ Indeed, they themselves stand in awe of him. Also the verse, وَيَدَعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ they call upon us out of longing and awe and humble themselves before us. Also the verse, who, Those who are in awe of their Lord and fear the harshness of the reckoning. Also the verse, For those who fear the time they will stand before their Lord, there are two gardens. And the verse, this reward is for those who are in awe of meeting me and of my warn warning. Okay, so those are probably like a half dozen verses, which is very clear that having khashya and having uh, fear and awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part of our faith. Yes, our faith is rooted in love, of course, as we said, but there is also in that a fear that we become disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about fear of God, we mean... I know that there can be a punishment for such and such act, so therefore I will stay away from that act. Additionally, due to the hadith of Adi ibn Hatim in the two authentic collections, Bukhari and Muslim, nara tamra, fear the fire even if it is with half a date. Also due to the hadith of Anas, 
لو تعلمون ما أعلم ولا ضحكتم قليلا ولا بكيتم كثيرا if you knew what I know you would laugh little and weep a lot so the first hadith fearing the fire even if it's with a uh, half of a date it means that we are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence in our life we are aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us and, and observing us even down to the minute detail. So we're not the type of Muslims, for example, that we're very good when we go to the mosque and we pray and we pray Juma, but then when we leave that, we leave like our taqwa behind and we sort of you know do whatever we want to do and we find a way to justify it to ourselves. No, rather we are, uh, as we are in public, so we are in private, even when it comes to the sort of the, the smallest thing. I mean, what's smaller than a half of a date? It's not even a whole date. It's a half of a date. So I'm sitting in the mosque and it's Ramadan and, you know, they pass out the dates and the water and we're breaking our fast. And the guy next to me, you know, he takes half of the date and he eats it and he puts the half of a date down and, uh, I don't know, his kid is calling him. So he leaves the half a date and he goes after his kid. So I'm going to give you an example, actually, with a half of a date. So I'm not going to sit down, you know, and just like, well, he left. I'm going to eat his half of a date. I'm going to make sure that it's preserved because the man was fasting just like I was fasting. He come, he's going to come back. I want to give it to him. So there is no difference, therefore, between the big stuff and the small stuff. Our attitude is going to be the same towards the big stuff as it is towards the small stuff. We are going to be aware of how we function with both. Why? Because it's connected to our belief. If it's connected to some sort of material or quantitative attitude, this is a small thing. It's not, it doesn't matter. It's not like a big thing. It's a small sin. It's a white lie. You have this sort of quantitative attitude. Then <clears throat> you will slip on the small stuff. But the believer is, is I mean, one of, the, one of the, the adjectives that describes the Prophet before Islam was as-sadiq al-ameen. He was honest and trustworthy. No one ever accused him of lying, ever. No one accused him of being dishonest. They just, you know, people of Quraysh didn't like what he had to say because he upended everything. He upended their way of life. But they couldn't come and say, well, you're lying. You're dishonest. So an honest person is somebody who's cons con con uh, consistently honest with the big stuff as with the small stuff. So that's a very important concept uh, that we need to also think about that for us, it doesn't matter uh, the big stuff and the small stuff. It's the same because we know that Allah Ta'ala is watching us. And there's another famous hadith by Anas. If you knew what I know, you would laugh little and weep a lot. Well, the Prophet Azam told us everything that we need to know. But the Prophet Asasim saw things that we did not see. You know, he went on the Isra and the Ma'raj. He saw the people of paradise and he saw the people of hellfire. He saw the extent, the stuff that we read about in the Quran. He saw that. He saw what it's going to be like. So seeing is very different than believing in the unseen. So it's a higher level. So he's saying if you saw that stuff the way I saw it, you know, you would be, you wouldn't laugh so much. You know that this is serious. And for you to be able to understand that, it's important that you remember death frequently. The Prophet ﷺ said, Remember often or remember frequently the destroyer of pleasures. That's the name that the Prophet ﷺ gave death. And it really does destroy pleasure because, you know, as, as someone who has a lot of mosque responsibilities, uh, you know, I get calls all the time that people passed away and I just have to drop what I'm doing and go. Do, and you, I see that. I, I, I see how it's such a, such a clever name that the Prophet Sassam gave death because it just comes out of nowhere and it stops everything. And and now you got to drop all of the stuff that you were doing, the quote unquote pleasure stuff. And now you got to go deal with that. You've got to go wash the body and shroud it and pray on it and bury it. You know, it takes a couple of days sometimes and, and uh, you are aware of that. So remembering death frequently helps you be more serious in these endeavors. Okay, back, going back to the text. A man once criticized one of his friends 
because of his constant weeping. But he wept more and replied, Bakaytu ala dhunubi lu'udhmi jurmi wa huqqa li kulli man ya'asi al-buka'a falaw kana al-buka'u yaruddu hammi la as'adi la as'ad la as'adti al-dumu'a ma'an dima'u I weep because of my sins due to the greatness of my crime as weeping is only right for those who transgress. If only weeping could remove my grief, I would be happy to shed tears of blood. So that's, I mean, very dramatic uh, and, and goes to the point that this is a serious matter and you have to take your life seriously. Inshallah, we, we um, hang our hopes on Allah Ta'ala's mercy, but the, the situation is serious. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz would constantly recite this couplet, وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي عَيْشِ مْرِئٍ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ فِي دَارِ الْقَرَارِ نَصِيبُ There is no good in the life of a man if he does not have a portion from Allah in the eternal abode. Because right? that's all that matters. What matters is what's going to happen in the hereafter because that's going to be everlasting. Whereas this life is very transient. And then he concludes the chapter by saying, Abu al-Fath al-Baghdadi heard a voice calling out in the cemetery of Shuniziya. I'm assuming that's in Baghdad. وَكَيْفَ تَنَامُ الْعَيْنُ وَهَيَا قَرِيرَةٌ وَلَمْ تَدْرِي فِي أَيِّ الْمَحَلَّيْنِ تَنْزِلُ How can the eyes sleep soundly silent when they do not know which of the two abodes they will reside in? Thereafter, he could not sleep. Now, I want to say something about these stories. The, the Quran and the Sunnah, we kind of know how to, hopefully you've gotten a sense now of how we interpret them and how we understand them. But these stories of the Salaf, uh, I also want to mention something because I remember as a young student, uh, it was it, sometimes it could be overwhelming. And my teachers would you know, teach us, these stories are meant to show you different people's experience with with this particular lesson in other words these are things that these are ways that real people before us took these concepts and naturally lived them the point of the story is not that you do that that you stop sleeping because if you try to do that you would die because sleep deprivation is a form of torture you have to sleep your body has a right to sleep but this man Abu al-Fath al-Baghdadi radiallahu anhu, this was a natural, organic response. He literally could not sleep after he heard that because he took it so seriously. You can't do that. So the point of the story is to show, look how somebody has taken this branch of faith and acted on it. But you can't do that. I remember one time I was with one of my teachers and um, he was telling me how one of his teachers, or, or actually two teachers prior, so somebody he had not met nor had I met, but he was saying the story is that he was extremely generous and he would never, like the Prophet one of his descriptions is that he would never say no. So he said, this sheikh, he had this, he inherited this from the Prophet that he would never say no. If somebody came to him, he would put his hand in his pocket and whatever came out, he would give. And uh, one, one time, he put his hand in his pocket and he had a hundred pound note. And this was like in the 1940s, 1950s. And at that time, a hundred Egyptian pounds was, just, you know, you know, you could buy like a house with it. And I mean, it's just, it's like, imagine putting your hand in your pocket and pulling out $10,000 and giving it to somebody. I mean, it's ridiculous. You, you, no one would do that. So this is how generous he was. And when the Sheikh was telling me the story, we were on a train and the train ride ended and we were going from the train to an airport. So we had all of these bags. So we needed someone, you know, somebody at the train station helped us. So uh, there, there was that moment where I'm supposed to tip the man. And I looked at the sheikh and then the sheikh laughed because he understood what I was trying to do. And, he, and that's when he gave me this lesson that I'm giving you. He said, no, 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 you can't, you can't act like that. I'm not telling you the story for you to put your hand in your pocket and give all of your cash away because it won't be genuine. It won't be natural. I'm showing you how some people can inherit certain things from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam naturally. So 
Um, and I was like, Alhamdulillah, because I had very li limited dollars and I needed, you know, there are going to be more people that we have to tip along the way. So when you, when you read stories like this, uh, and then you couldn't sleep after that, that doesn't mean that you sleeping is haram uh, or bad. It's just showing you how somebody genuine took this lesson, internalized it, and this is how he lived with it. And you have to find your own original, genuine way with these things. Maybe this one branch didn't speak to you. Maybe another branch will speak to you. But then you internalize it, and it becomes you, and it becomes natural, and then it becomes truly you. You truly own it. Okay, number 12. The 12th from the branches of faith is belief in the necessity of having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Based on the speech of Allah, وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَفُونَ عَذَابَهُ إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّكَ كَانَ Mahdura. They hope for his mercy and fear for his punishment. The punishment of your Lord is much to be feared. Also the verse, وَدَعُوهُ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا إِنَّ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Call on him fearing and hoping. The mercy of Allah is close to those who do good. And the verse, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say, Allah says, my servants who have harmed yourselves by your own excesses, do not despair of Allah's mercy. Allah forgives all sins. He is truly the most forgiving, the most merciful. Also the verse, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah does not forgive the joining of partners with him. Shirk. Anything less than that, he forgives to whoever he wills. Okay, so these verses remind us that there is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah's promise is true. The hellfire is true. Uh, sin is true. At the same time, we are meant to have hope that Allah is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the most merciful, the most compassionate. You know, this is the first verse of the Qur'an. All of the surahs except Surah At-Tawbah begin with this verse. In the Shafi'i Madhab, it's considered a verse of, of, of every chapter, which is why we, we, when we begin a surah as a Shafi'i, you have to recite that verse. <clears throat> so having hope in Allah's mercy is something that is very, very important for faith, which is why people of faith tend to be are supposed to be optimistic, happy, uh, calm, composed, etc. Additionally, due to the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in the two collections of Bukhari and Muslim, لَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمُؤْمِنُ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنَ الْعَقُوبَةِ مَا طَمِعَ بِجَنَّتِهِ أَحَدٌ وَلَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْكَافِرُ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ مَا قَنَتَ مِنْ جَنَّتِهِ أَحَدٌ If the believer knew what Allah has prepared for punishment, none would have hope for his garden. And if the disbeliever knew what Allah had prepared of mercy, none would lose hope of his garden. But because we are believers and we know that there are both, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy far surpasses his wrath. And therefore we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always hoping for his mercy. Also due to the hadith of Jabir in Muslim, uh, in Sahih Muslim, that is, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن الظن بالله عز وجل. None of you should die except that he has a good opinion of Allah. Which is why, if you do, um, like end of life care for people, or if you're around a relative or a parent or a community member, uh, and it's the end stages of their life, it's very important that you infuse them with hope uh, and longing for Allah Taala's mercy and love. It's not the time that you go in with fire and brimstone. I mean, that's that's for young, you know, young kids that are not really serious about life. But the older you get, the more you the balance, the scales tip towards the mercy. Additionally, due to the hadith of Abu Huraira in Bukhari and Muslim, يقول الله عز وجل أنا عند ظن عبدي بي وأنا معه حين يذكرني. Allah says, I am as my servant thinks of me, and I am with him when he remembers me. I mean, it's a beautiful hadith. Allah is as you think of him. So if you if you think of Allah as loving, merciful, forgiving, that's how you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think of Allah as uh, the causer of death and destruction, so on and so forth, then that's how you're going to worship. That's what, what Allah is going to be for you. And that kind of gives you a sense of uh, the psychology behind extreme Muslims, uh, even if they're not violent, but people that just have extreme views 
uh, and and people that are you know preaching as we say in English the gospel of love, uh, you know talking about Rumi and love and and you know compassion and and these type of things. It's 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 oftentimes informed by how they think of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, Abu Uthman Said ibn Ismail recited the couplets. ما بال دينك ترضى أن تدنسه وإن ثوبك مخصول من الدنس ترجو النجاة ولم تسلك مسالكها إن سفينة لا تجري على اليبس. Why does it please you to disgrace your religion? Yet you ensure your garments are washed from filth. You hope for salvation, yet you do not take its paths. How can that be as the ships do not sail on dry ground? And we'll put a pin in it here for today. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam wa salli lahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Any questions? Anything not clear? This is your time to ask. Some people, I think, tried to reach out to me. Um, I think I may, might have forgotten to mention this. The best way to reach me is to send me an email at info at makingsenseofislam.com. I'll put it in the chat. Um, that's the best way if, if people have a question or something like that they didn't want to ask uh, in the class. But are there any questions that people have or is there anything that's not clear? Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullah. Um, I, I I wanted to see if we we can uh, expand a little on that uh, issue of tasawuf. Mm. Just briefly. <laughs> That's Wait. like uh, somebody asking me, "Can you talk about Islamic history briefly?" <laughs> okay. Uh, tasawuf is. Uh, Tasawuf is Islam, and Islam is Tasawuf. Uh, and that's really the best, uh, shortest way to understand it. In, in the hadith of Gabriel, in which the Prophet ﷺ was approached by Gabriel, and he was asked about Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the final hours. This hadith is very important because the ulama use this hadith to uh, distinguish the different Islamic sciences. There is a there is a rhyme and reason to the Islamic sciences. Even when I when you hear me refer to Islamic intellectual history or Islamic sciences, we we consider all of these ulum sciences, and the reason they're sciences is because science, as is understood in the in modern English, which is refers refers unfortunately only to experimental science, is what makes a science experimental is that when I do the experiment every time I get the same results. So the reason we refer to them in Islam as sciences is because you get the same results. So tasawwuf is a science. It's the science of ihsan. It's the science of worshiping God as if you see him. And if you can't do that, know that he sees you. Because the recipe and the remedies that the people of the, the scholars of tasawwuf taught us produce those same results. That's why we follow you know, their instruction of how we implement the Quran and the Sunnah. So while Islam in that hadith refers to the Sharia sciences and while Iman in the hadith refers to the theological sciences, so those two things are how we, um, the things that we do, that's what the Sharia teaches us, how to pray and how to fast. Uh, Iman teaches us what we believe in, but Tasawwuf teaches us how to be all the time. The legal sciences and the theological sciences only deal with a minority of the hadith and the quran so the vast majority of our faith is tasawwuf that's why i began by saying tasawwuf is islam and islam is tasawwuf tasawwuf or tazkiyah uh, or ihsan or al akhlaq i mean has multiple names it all teaches us how to function. How do we take the stuff that we're talking about now, for example, and actually how do we implement it and live it on a day-to-day -day basis? 
How do we deal with ourselves, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our parents, our spouse, so on and so forth. So tasawuf is one of the most important sciences that we have. If, if you're continuing these classes with me, one of the books that we will study, um, The Manual of Islam by Imam al-Nawawi, there's a section on tasawuf. So we'll get into more details. I, I don't know when the class is off the top of my head right now, but inshallah, I plan to teach the entire, all of the books straightforward from now until the end of January. So when we get to that, I'll make sure that we, we spend a little bit more time explaining it. Jazakallah khair. Anybody else have any questions? Assalamu alaikum Ustad, somebody sent um, me admin the chat on chat. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Could you please shed some light on Isa Le Thawab according to Shafi Madhab? Uh, shed light on what? Isa Le Thawab. Like, uh, it's like, a, I think, an Urdu term. Uh, in Urdu, say, example, uh, if somebody passes away uh, huh? and we want to do some uh, good deeds on behalf of them or for them. Ah, okay. This is universally accepted. This is not a Shafi or Madhab thing. This is an Islamic thing. Anything that we do for the deceased uh, and we we uh, dedicate the reward of that act goes to them with, by consensus of the ulama. There's no dissenting opinion. There, it's not even an issue. It's not even an issue to discuss uh, because the Prophet ﷺ uh, uh, informed us and taught us that we can perform hajj for are deceased. The Hajj is the act of Islam that encompasses everything. It encompasses prayer, it encompasses fasting, it encompasses sadaqah, it encompasses tawaf, it encompasses sa'i, it encompasses the jamarat, it encompasses qira'at al-Qur'an, so on, all of those things. So if the entire Hajj goes, then that means its parts also go. So this is the legal justification for that. Uh, the only thing that we can't do for the deceased is we can't make up their prayers because the Prophet, uh, because Allah Ta'ala says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta, that the prayer has been given as a specific allotted time. <laughs> but somebody who hasn't fasted and passed away, you can fast for them. Somebody who hasn't performed umrah or hajj, you can do that for them. You can give sadaqah, donate the thawab for that. You can read Quran and the, 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 the reward of reading this Quran goes to them so on and so forth. Why is this an issue that modern Muslims talk about? Because of this modern Salafi, Wahhabi way of thinking, and it's a very material way of thinking that they assume that when a person dies, life is over. And that's why I said death is not the end of life. It's the movement of one form of living to another form of living. And that's why we have these hadith that the prophets are alive in their graves and that the Prophet ﷺ intercedes on our behalf every week. All of these are sahih hadith. So if you understand that, then you understand that the people that have died before us are still alive in, in you know, the capital A, not a lowercase a, of course. And therefore, uh, as the hadith informed us, anything that we do can benefit for them. Allah, the Prophet says in the hadith that when you die, your, your hisab or your opportunity to do good deeds is cut off except for three. One of them is waladun salih yad'ula, a pious descendant. Doesn't have to be a child, but it could be of anybody that prays for them. So that means that the dua goes to the reward of that goes to that person, so on and so forth. So this is not something that's limited to the madhahib or madhahib specific. Anybody else? Okay. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم I'll see everyone tomorrow same time إن شاء الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته